Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Welcome back to the Shema Podcast. Yom Kippur is approaching, and I was thinking back to something many years ago to that mount sinai experience that i had that i've shared with you before back after six months of reading logical proofs of torah and i remember that moment when i was sitting there at my desk and i finally just acquiesced and realized okay this is true this is really true so what's next I remember the first thing I did was I looked at my daily Atkins breakfast of a plate of bacon and I pushed it back and said, no more. From now on, I am keeping kosher. No more selfish. No more bacon. It's gone. I don't understand why God does not want me to enjoy those foods, but I know now he made me and he's telling me it's not good for me. And then I sat back and thought to myself, So what else do Jews do besides not eating bacon on their cheeseburger? And then I realized I needed to begin to observe the Jewish holidays. And I started to think back of the Jewish holidays so I could begin to observe them. And to be honest with you, they weren't the fondest memories. I knew there was Hanukkah. And my memories as a kid growing up was my Parents yelling out, it's time to stop playing with your toys by the Christmas tree. We need to light the menorah. And I would think to myself, but I just opened the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip. I don't want to come light candles. And then I remember Passover Seder, sitting around the table, looking at the roasted egg, eating the matzah with the horseradish, and thinking to myself, All my friends are eating Cadbury eggs and chocolate bunnies. And this is what I get? And then I remember there was another holiday sometime in the fall where I remembered as a boy that it was a time to sit and think about all the things you did wrong. And then God would punish us for those sins by making us sit in synagogue all day long. And I remember at a young age praying to God my thoughts, saying, please, I will never, ever complain about being in school. Just get me out of this. But of course, I have a much different outlook on the meaning of the Jewish holidays now. And Yom Kippur is one that I especially do appreciate. A lot of us fear it. But to me, I think it is the most uplifting day of the year. The reason why is because a lot of who we think we are of how we define ourselves, our personality, it's not true. It's really not who we are. I've read a great analogy that it's like putting on layers of clothing. The way we internalize our experiences causes us to put on these false layers of clothing. And they often become a garment that prohibit us from really expressing our true selves. I have an experience with this, being a father. My daughter has always had a very inquisitive mind. She learned how to read very early on and became an avid reader. She loved to write. She's uh, an amazing artist, although she's become very private about it in her older years. But I just remember the dedication she took when she decided she wanted to learn how to draw the human hand, which is very intricate, many bones and tendons. And she would sit there and watch YouTube videos on how to draw the hand and and all the shadows perfectly to make it look realistic. But one day in the fifth grade, she came home with some test scores where she was doing very poorly in math. And I said, what is going on with math? Do you need my help? And she said, Dad, I'm just not good at math. And I saw her putting on that clothing that she is not good at math. So what I did was, is I downloaded the previous year's state exam. And every day when she would come from school, 
I would have something very sweet for her to enjoy. And we would go through those math exercises one after another, a little bit at a time. And then the state exam came. And when the results arrived in the mail, my daughter came home from school and I started going over the grade she got in each of the areas. She did well in English composition and in writing, science, social studies. And she said, of course, dad, those are the subjects I'm good at. And then I told her her math score. It was the highest score that she received out any subject. And she looked very astonished that that was the case, that she got the highest score in math. And I said, so look, I guess you can no longer say I'm not good at math because clearly the evidence is showing you are. And she said, fine, maybe I am good at math, but I don't like math. And I said, that's fine. Just don't ever say you're not good at math. I didn't want her to put on such a false belief. And that's what we do so much. We have these ideas, these limiting thoughts, and they hold us back. And just like my daughter was about to put on this limiting belief that she wasn't good at math when I knew she was, it made me so sad to see that she was limiting her potential. And I know that's the same feeling that God gets when we limit ourselves, when we think less of us than who we truly are. You know, I have a a friend, amazing guy, one of those personalities that everyone just gets drawn to, very witty and funny. And he became religious later on in life and decided then that he wanted to get married, but it had to be a woman who was observant to Torah. And as you can imagine later on in life, the pool of Torah observant Jews in the world is a very small number. And then you have the pandemic, which makes it very difficult to travel and meet people and interact with them. And this person is getting very frustrated with his inability to meet his perfect match. And that's an experience that potentially can cause him to begin to think that that's just the way it is. Now, clearly, God thinks this man is the most precious person to change and become an observant Jew later in life, as I can attest to, is a challenging thing. And then to say, I'm alone, I want to be married, but I'm only going to marry a Torah observant Jew, no matter how difficult it is. It's even more than just these limiting thoughts on who we are, but these conditions we've been in that God is orchestrating for a perfect reason. And we begin to think that that's just the way it is always going to be. Whenever you're doing something to fulfill God's will, then everything always works out incredibly well. And that's what Yom Kippur is. God is asking us, to think about all the things we've done wrong, our bad habits, everything that we want to change about ourselves, put it on the table, ask for forgiveness. But the truth is, is that God will immediately forgive. The problem is, is that we don't forgive ourselves. We don't stop identifying with those negative thoughts, the negative words, the negative actions. And what he is telling us, what he is pleading with us to do is to let go of it. He is creating us anew after we do Teshuvah. When we go through Yom Kippur, He is creating us anew, and the only one that holds us back in our own ways is us. We know that the birth of the Jewish people was as they stood at Mount Sinai and received the Torah. But if you step back a little earlier in the saga from that moment, that when the Jews went through the Red Sea, the Red Sea was akin to a birth canal. And so when was the moment of conception? And the moment was, is as the Jewish people were standing at the banks of the sea with the Egyptian army approaching and with their finite minds thinking, what can we possibly do now? Either we drown or we die by the sword. There's no other option here. And God told Moses to stop praying. It's time to take action. And what happened next? is Nishan. He was, he recognized something. He saw that we are connected to the infinite creator. We are a portal for the infinite creator into this world. And when we make his will, our will, everything's possible. 
And he just began to walk into the water with this mindset that he is limitless in his potential because his creator that he's connected to is limitless in his potential. And as he began to walk into the water to the point to where the water covered his nose, the water had no choice but to get out of his way. And when I think about you know, where I've come from, from just 10 years ago, from such a crass and crude human being to being less crass and crude of human being. And I think about the fact that even though I've come so far for me, when I stand in the presence of my rabbis, I feel so infinitesimal compared to them. And I know they feel the same when they stand by their rabbis. I know those rabbis think the same, that they're infinitesimal compared to the sages of yesteryear. And the sages of yesteryear think that they are infinitesimal compared to Moses. There's so much potential we all have. And all God is trying to show us is that when we make God's will our will, God makes our will his will. And everything becomes possible. God is above nature. Mankind, the Jewish people, can be elevated beyond nature. And so I really want to explore deeper, Yom Kippur, how we can really all harness this to achieve what it is that God wants us to achieve, which is this mindset of limitless potential. So I called up Rabbi Busco, our teacher that you've all learned from, our friend. And I said, would you be willing to come on and talk about Yom Kippur? And he said, do you want me to go deep? And I said, of course. But what I was thinking to myself was, If I didn't want to go deep, I wouldn't be asking Rabbi Busco to come on and teach us. Okay, thank you for having me on your podcast again. I'm excited to to be here. What I'm going to do first is give a basic overview of everything I'm going to talk about so you know what's coming. The goal of what I'm doing here is to give us an approach to Yom Kippur, and I'll give some context to, to what I mean by that. Recently, I saw that a rabbi had published a question that was posed to him by one of his students, a teenage boy. He said, Rabbi, I hate going to these services. He's a religious Jew. He grew up religious his entire life. But Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, they're just miserable. He doesn't enjoy it. Is there any way that he could possibly enjoy the experience when it's ostensibly just putting yourself through torture, sitting there fasting? You're supposed to be all stressed out because you're being judged. Is there any way to actually enjoy it? And in a nutshell, he basically said that... While it's true, it's not enjoyable. If you can really understand and appreciate the gift of what you can accomplish with Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, so that appreciation will carry you through. And so basically that sounded to me like, you know, I'm going to the dentist for root canal. And if I appreciate enough that I really need the root canal and that it's ultimately good for my dental health, so then I'll get through it. I'll be able to manage somehow. But the root canal is still root canal. It's a horrible thing to go through. It's not at all enjoyable. And so the goal of what I want to present to you is to have a framework of understanding, a context, and also a practical application of what we can do uh, leading up to Yom Kippur and on the day of Yom Kippur as well for how to actually enjoy it, how to engage in it. And first and foremost, before I get into all of that, the basic approach is number one, you have to dive in. If this is just something you're going through the motions because it's the Jewish thing to do, this is your Judaism, once a year you go to the shul, the synagogue for Yom Kippur, and you sit there and you go through the motions and and you're sort of waiting for it to end, it will be torture. If you fully engage, if you dive in head first and you make a decision, which is really, that's where it begins, you make the decision, I'm going to get into it. Then not only will you be able to successfully manage your your day, but you'll you'll love it. It can be an ecstatic experience. So that's where we want to get to. So the basic overview of what I'm going to discuss is we're going to start with the more abstract concepts first about judgment and mercy and all of these fundamental ideas that we're dealing with during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and how they interact with each other. And moving from there to the idea of what's called tshuva, repentance and the different levels of tshuva and understanding that and and how to approach it. And then we'll end off with a very practical application of what kind of mindset we should be in on the day itself. 
and and understanding the approach to the to the actual customs of Yom Kippur, like fasting and things like that, and and how we can actually enjoy it as opposed to suffer through it. So first of all, with the concept of of judgment and mercy, let's talk about judgment first. And some people who've heard me speak have, have maybe heard this this example that I give because this is one of my favorite pieces of Talmud. It's in the tractate of Tainus, Ta'anit, page 20. And it's a, it's a very fascinating story, which, which on, the, on surface level sounds bizarre. When I tell you this story, it's not going to make any sense. But it's really insightful to understand judging other people. And what the point is going to be is really also judging ourselves and how to approach that. So the story is as follows. The Talmud says that Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, some say it was the opposite, Rabbi Shimon Lazar, was traveling along the road. He was coming back from a place called Migdal Gador, and he had just been studying with his rabbi for a, a long time, and he had reached a tremendously high level, and he was very, very happy from all of the Torah that he had learned, and he comes back riding on his donkey, and as he's traveling along the road, he encounters a man who is exceptionally ugly, and the ugly man greets him, and he says, Shalom Aleichem, Rebbe, which is standard greeting for someone that you respect, and he ignores him. And the man is a little bit incensed. And eventually, Rav Shimon Lazar turns to this ugly man, and he says, you are so ugly. Is everyone from your city as ugly as you? And that was his answer. That was his response to this man trying to greet him and, and show him respect. And so the man responded to him. I mean, already at this point in the story, this is perplexing. We're, we're, just, we're talking about one of the greatest sages that existed in his time, and he's coming back who, from sp- tremendous spiritual up- upliftment. So the man responds to Rabbi Shem Lazar and he says, why don't you go tell the creator that he made such an ugly vessel? And at that point, the rabbi, Rabbi Shem Lazar, knew that he had sinned and he got off his donkey and he began to grovel and he was begging for this man's forgiveness. And the man refused to forgive him. There's no way. And the rabbi is following this man all the way back to his home, all along the way, trying to beg for his forgiveness, the man refusing. Eventually, they get to a city, and the people of the town come out. They're very excited to see such a great rabbi. They say, Shalom Aleichem, Rebbe, Rebbe, Mori, Mori, my teacher. And they're trying to show this rabbi such great respect. The quote-unquote ugly man, as he's walking into the city, says, Who are you calling rabbi? Who are you calling a rabbi? And they said, Him, the one behind you, the one who's following you. He's a great rabbi. He says, If that's a rabbi, there should be a lot less of rabbis in, in Israel. And, and they said, Well, you really shouldn't talk like that. And he said, you know, he, he told them the whole story, what, what he said to him. And they said, you know, even still, he's such a great man. He's learned so much Torah, you should forgive him. So the ugly man says that I, I wouldn't personally forgive him, but because of all of you, if you demand such a thing, then, then I'll forgive him on your behalf. And as long as he doesn't do this again. And the rabbi repented. He committed to, to not behaving like this again. And he went into the local synagogue there and he said, a man should be soft and pliable like a reed and not hard like cedar wood. And that's it. That's the end of the story. And there's no explanation that's given in the Talmud itself, but this is actually very common uh, for these kinds of perplexing stories to be left in puzzle form, in a locked form. So we rely on our commentaries, our great sages that have had a tradition for how to unlock these stories and, and reveal to us what they really mean. And what we're taught by some of these commentaries is, first of all, every detail that we're given about the story is very significant. The fact that he was traveling from a place called Migdal Gadur, which in Hebrew means the Tower of Separation. And he had been in a place where he was completely elevated beyond the physical world. And that's further illustrated by the fact that he was riding on top of his donkey. Donkey in Hebrew is chamor. And the word chamor shares the same root, the same linguistic root as the word chomer, which means physical substance. A donkey represents physicality, that it just, it's brute force. So the fact that he was riding on top of his donkey, if you find that at any point in Jewish literature, what that is meant to symbolize is someone that has conquered their physicality, where they're completely dominating their physicality with their spirituality. And when we understand that that's where he's coming from, then the story shifts a little bit. Because when he sees this man and he perceives this man as ugly, it's the exact opposite than what we had assumed, that he was so superficial. It's the exact opposite. He saw straight through this man's physicality. It could be he was a good-looking guy. But he saw the man's behavior. He saw the man's spiritual character. And he saw that it was ugly. 
You know, people say, well, they're, they're pretty on the inside. This man was ugly on the inside, right? That's what he saw directly to him. And he refused to, to interact with this man. And just so that we can relate to that a little bit, it's for someone on that level of spirituality to be in such proximity with that kind of negativity, that kind of distortion on a spiritual level, it would be like being in the room with something really foul smelling. I mean, it's just abhorrent to be near. And he didn't even want to communicate with the person. He, did, he wouldn't respond to him. And he turned to him and said, you're so ugly. How, is this how you behave? Is everyone from your town like this? Do you come from a place where everyone behaves like you? And the response that this man gives is extremely telling of what our approach should be towards judging other people. And in fact, our commentators say that this man who was spiritually ugly was actually Elijah the prophet in disguise, even spiritually in disguise. He appeared to him as a spiritually low character to teach him, to teach Rabbi Shem ben Elazar this lesson. And he said, why don't you go ask the creator why he made such an ugly vessel? And the lesson he's imparting is this. Most of us, we walk around and we see people's external behavior or they do something maybe even once and we judge them based on that action. It's such a superficial judgment that we have of these people. If we could see into their souls and we see all the great things they do, we would have a completely different picture of this person. Well, he did. Rabbi Shem ben Elazar had the whole picture of the person. He saw into his spiritual character and he saw actually how this person is. And he felt that with that image of the person, then he could judge him. And what Elijah was telling him is that even if you can see that, even if you see directly into the soul of the person and you can see their whole spiritual character, even that is not enough to judge them because it could be that the creator made them very specifically to have that character, to be on a low level. And the point is that being in this world, the objective is not to be on the highest rung of the ladder, so to speak. The objective is to climb. And some people are created on very high rungs. And their goal is to climb to maybe from rung 55 to rung 75. And it could be that a person is created on rung three. And his goal is to try to reach rung four. Just to try. Maybe he'll get there, maybe he won't. But that's what God wants him to do. That's what his soul needs in this world. In fact, to even further illustrate this idea, we have another piece of Talmud where Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was the leader of the Jewish people at the time of the destruction of the temple, he was on a spiritual level that we couldn't comprehend the Talmud says that his entire life, he was completely immersed in spirituality and Torah study, that he could understand the communication of trees and birds. He was on a completely different level, and he taught Torah to the entire Jewish people. On his deathbed, he was weeping, and his students asked him, why are you so upset? And he says, I have no idea where I'm going. I don't know where they're going to take me. Maybe they'll take me to the good place. Maybe they'll take me to the bad place. And his students were baffled. How could you not know? You're, you're the greatest of all of us. But that's the answer. What we just saw is that not only can we not judge other people, we can't even judge ourselves. Because everything that we have accomplished or have not accomplished, that we've tried to do, we don't know what we were created for, the kind of potential that we have and what, what is expected from us. It's possible someone could be born as the, the son of the greatest scholar in the world at the time, and his entire life is immersed in spirituality and he's grown tremendously and he himself becomes a great scholar and teacher. But it could be that for him it was very easy that he was set up that way his entire life and he was put in this world. And it could be that what he's accomplished wasn't quite enough, even though he's objectively done tremendous things. Whereas compared to someone else, contrasted to a person who grew up in, in gang violence, it could be that this person's goal in life, what he's expected to accomplish by God, is when he goes to mug this lady on the street, is he just going to take her purse or is he also going to attack her physically? And if he decides to just take her purse and not to hit her, then he's accomplished his spiritual ascension. And so once we understand that it's impossible to judge other people and it's impossible to judge ourselves, so that takes a lot of the pressure off. The only thing we need to do is we need to make the right decision, the next right decision. And we don't know if we're accomplishing what we need to accomplish. All we have is a set of rules and we try our best. Now, that leads us to what is judgment? You know, what, what is real judgment? I think often people have a, a distaste for the concept of being judgmental, which usually it is. As we just explained, 
in most cases, being judgmental of other people is very negative and it's, it's just wrong. So how do we deal with the fact that God is judging us? It's very uncomfortable. So to reframe that, it's helpful to understand that the concept of judgment from a Torah perspective is definition. It's not about being judgmental or criticizing or condemning. It's about defining something. What is this in, in the context of us, of people? Who are you as a person? Who are you? What have you created for yourself and the moral state of yourself? And again, that's something that we can't know even for ourselves, where we are and what we've created for ourselves and how we've built ourselves. But that is what is being judged on Rosh Hashanah. And that judgment process extends until Yom Kippur, which I'll explain. But that's what's happening here is that God is looking at us and saying, who, who are you? And it's up to us to decide who we are. And God, God's looking at us and saying, what have you done? What have you done to create yourself? And that's in our hands to decide for ourselves to define who we are. And the truth is that this could be done at any moment. We can redefine ourselves at any moment using repentance, which I'll explain a little bit more later on. But it could even be done instantaneously. The Talmud says, Yesh kone alamo achas. It's possible for a person to acquire his eternal life even in one moment. The, the Talmud relates a story of a certain person who was who was very morally inept. And he had descended to the lowest levels of spirituality. And at a certain point, he realized that there was no turning back. And it really struck him where he had hit rock bottom spiritually. And the Gemara says, the Talmud says that he went out and he sat on top of a hill and he called out to the mountains and he said, will you please speak up for me? Help me come back to God. And there was no answer. He saw the mountains weren't going to help him. And he called out to the heavens, and the heavens wouldn't help him. And he called out to everything. And he saw that nothing's going to help him. The matter depends only on him. He put his, knee, his head between his knees, and he began to weep and sob and cry. And the Talmud says that his soul left his body. And from that point on, in the heavens, they called him rabbi. I heard once from one of my rabbis, why did he die? That seems very dramatic. Well, the idea is that, again, we're, we're defining who we are. And to change who you are is not so simple. To take a piece of wood and to bend it into a certain place, you could do it over time. You could bend a tree so that it could do all kinds of loops and things like that, but you can't do it instantaneously. It takes time to bend it and, and slowly, slowly, it eventually grows that way. It's possible, theoretically, to bend it in half, but what will happen then is it'll break. It's possible for a person to change so radically that he could be called rabbi in the heavens, even though previously he was the lowest of the low. But to transition from that person to the person that he is now is so radically different that he cannot continue in the same existence. So therefore, his soul had to leave his body. He had to die. It was such an extreme change. This is the concept that we see. Is that It's about defining the self. It's about who are you. And the process of, of repentance is, is really altering that. Okay, so before we get to tshuva, I want to discuss, so we, I, we brought up the concept of judgment, and judgment is really related to Rosh Hashanah, and that process of judgment continues throughout until Yom Kippur, which is 10 days after, but it's really contrasted these two concepts of judgment and mercy. Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment, and Yom Kippur is a day of mercy. And so now we've spoken a little bit about judgment, let's talk about mercy and what mercy is. Now, first of all, you can't have 100% mercy. What I see is that in, in two rivaling religions that had developed after Judaism, we have Christianity and Islam. They seem to be polar opposites. They've taken each one of these two concepts and run in, in that direction. We find that in Christianity, grace and mercy is the entire focus. And in Islam, you see a lot of the opposite. There's a lot of strict judgment and force with Judgment without mercy is impossible to survive. We just wouldn't stand up to it. We would all fail. You need mercy to exist. Because the truth is that on the strictest level of judgment, if it's just pure judgment, any single moment that you're not maximizing your potential in this world, you really relinquish your, your right to exist. You're talking about 100% strict judgment. If at any moment you squander a single moment of potential, so then you didn't deserve that moment. 
and then you just you're gone. So we need mercy for literally every single moment of our lives. And the, and the Talmud says that even the greatest of all of us, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Gemara says, the Talmud says that they couldn't have, have lived a single moment without mercy. But on the other hand, if you only have mercy, we don't deserve anything. The entire purpose of us being in this world is to earn our self-perfection, to earn our connection to God, that godliness, that divinity. And if it's all mercy that it's just given to us, given to us free chances, then nothing belongs to us. We need judgment for that definition to say, who are you? You are a godly person. With only mercy, you don't have that. So we need a proper balance of judgment and mercy. But what's really interesting about mercy is that sometimes mercy can agree with judgment. So let me explain a little bit about the concept of mercy. Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler, who was a rabbi in England a couple generations ago, he gave the following analogy. I'll alter it a little bit to update it. But he said, let's say you have two kids. You have these two kids, Bob and Frank, and Bob comes from a broken home, and he's raised without a family, or he wasn't really raised at all. He grew up in the streets, and no one's really looking out for him. He had to figure it out himself. And he is totally into crime and fell in with gangs. That's the only way he could survive. And he's become twisted in his life. And Frank grew up in a neighboring environment and got to know Bob. But Frank comes from a good home. His parents care about him. They love him. And they're, they're trying to raise him right. But what can they do? Frank and Bob have become pretty good friends. And Bob is an influence on Frank. So it gets to a point one day where Bob and Frank, they hold up a gas station together. 14-year-old kids, and they get caught, and now they're both going to court. Now, the truth is, Bob didn't force Frank into doing it. Frank went willingly. They came as complete equals. They both did the exact same thing, both committed the exact same crime, both with the exact same volition. But when they come to court, the judge makes different decisions, and the reason is as follows. Let's look at it through the Jewish lens of, of mercy and judgment. So judgment is has no prejudice. Judgment is judgment across the board. Judgment says, these kids held up a gas station, they should go to juvie. That's the law. That's it. That's true for Bob. That's true for Frank. Okay, so judgment says the same thing for both of them. They should both go to juvie. Mercy looks at Frank, and Mercy says, well, well hold on here. There's probably a better solution. Because if we send Frank to juvie, it's going to ruin his life. He might have good potential. He could go to school. He could... He could possibly do well for himself. If he goes to juvie, it's just going to further his interactions with other criminals. It's going to reinforce this negative behavior, and it's going to totally kill his potential of the future. But if we forgo juvie and we send him home, maybe his parents can help him. Send him back to his family. Let them guide him on the right path, and maybe there will be a good chance for him to have a good life. Isn't that the whole purpose of the criminal justice system? It's supposed to be rehabilitational. That's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is the benefit of both these kids. Mercy here disagrees with judgment. Mercy says, I have a better option. Send the kid home. They can guide him. When it comes to Bob, Mercy doesn't disagree with judgment. What would happen if, if you wouldn't send Bob to juvie? He'll go back on the street. He'll go back to the gangs. He'll do the same exact thing he was before with no guidance, nothing to set him back on the right path. And on top of that, He'll have even more confidence that he can do whatever he wants and get away with it. It'll be much worse for him to not send him to juvie. Better to send him to juvie, and it's true he won't really have a future, but he didn't really have one anyway. There wasn't much of a chance for him. At least this way, he'll learn there are consequences for his actions. Mercy always looks for what's the most preferable outcome, regardless of what strict judgment should say. So here, mercy changes. For Frank, mercy is send him home to his family. For Bob, that's not the best option for Bob. For Bob, the best option is send him to juvie. Rabbi Dessler uses this analogy to explain why God is more merciful on the Jewish people than the rest of the nations. He's picking favorites. He, he loves the Jews more than other people. No. He explains because the Jewish people are rooted in a different place than the non-Jews. The Jewish people's soul is rooted in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these great spiritual luminaries. That's where we come from. It's, it's the, the source of who we are. And if we get out of control and we, quote unquote, hold up the proverbial gas station, there's still a chance for us. If you let us off the hook, we'll find our way home. 
because there's a place to go to. We'll reconnect back to our souls. We'll return to where we are, to where we really should be, back to our source. The non-Jews, God loves them also, but they're not rooted in the same place. They don't have these spiritual giants that were at the source of their creation. And so therefore, th this is what we're relying on. This mercy is not just letting us off the hook just for the sake of it. It's let us off the hook because there's a better option for us, because I can return back to my source, back to my spirituality. That's what we're using here. You know, there's a verse in, in Psalms that says, Ki imchos li And what's beautiful about Hebrew is that you can translate these verses in different ways. Ki imchos li you could translate it, like Rashi translates it as, forgiveness is only with you in order that you should be feared. Now, if you translate the verse like that, the meaning is, say someone sins against God, so he did something wrong. Well, instead of dealing with God, if he would be able to get his forgiveness elsewhere, like an angel or to buy a pardon from the church and get absolved, very convenient. There's no reason to fear God because he can do whatever he wants. He can get away with it and pay off his soul. Since forgiveness I can only get from God, I have to fear God. That's how Rashi interprets it. But the Ramban, Nachmanides, reads the verse differently because the word ki in Hebrew is very versatile. It could mean only, could mean because. So he reads it that, for since you have forgiveness, then you can be feared. The natural feeling that a person has after they sin is that they're unworthy. I mean, you imagine a person works at a company and he, he gets caught stealing from the company. Say he was stealing a million dollars. That employer, what's going to happen? That employer's going to fire him on the spot. There's no chance that he's going to be able to keep working for that company after what he did. Even if this guy can't find work elsewhere, going back to his original employer is just not an option. He's done. And in the eyes of employer, he's, he's worthless. We feel that too, naturally. When we, f when we sin, we feel like we did something wrong toward God or, or spiritually low. We naturally feel deep down, even if we're not conscious of it, that God's not interested in me anymore. I'm too low. I'm below the radar. I'm not, I'm not worthy of God's interest. And what we see from this verse in Psalms is a beautiful idea that because God does forgive me, I don't have to feel worthless. There's a reason for me to keep fearing God. I can keep trying. And that's what we're looking for in Yom Kippur, is we're looking for that forgiveness. We're looking for that mercy that, that's useful to us because we can return to who we are. We're looking for that forgiveness that's available to us on that day so that we can continue moving forward and redefining ourselves. Would you say, too, that it's sort of the, the tactic of the Yetzirah. It tries to influence you to do a sin, and then once you do the sin, get you to think you're such a worthless individual. You know, why even try? So we'll do another one. In the evening services, one of the blessings on the Kriya Shema is that we, want, we ask God to protect us from the evil from behind us and, and in front of us. And so one of the explanations is exactly what you said. The evil that's behind us is pushing us to do a sin, and then the evil that's in front of us is now that we've done the sin, it's coming from the other direction saying you should feel terrible about it. So yeah, you're 100% right. That, that, that is a tactic of, of the evil inclination, the Yitzhahara. Let's talk now about tshuva and understand the different levels because this is really the main mitzvah of the day of Yom Kippur is to redefine ourselves. We have that option, that with, which is miraculous. It's amazing that we can completely redefine ourselves. So let's understand that there are two fundamentally different kinds of tshuva that we're taught about. There's something called tshuva meyira and tshuva me'ahava. And tshuva meyira means repentance from a place of fear, and tshuva me'ahava is repentance from love. Now they're both valuable. I know it's, it may sound like tshuva from fear is, uh, sounds disparaging a little bit. But it's extremely valuable, and it's, and it's necessary also. When we're not coming from a place of love, we, we need to use that. But even within that, let's understand, because within fear, we have three levels of fear. There's something called yirasa onish, which means the fear of punishment. We have yirasa chet, which is the fear of sin itself. And then yirasa romumus, which means the fear of awe, of God's greatness. And these are in order of ascension. The fear of punishment is, is the most superficial the Rambam, Maimonides, says that this is the level that's for children, basically, that children can understand. Unfortunately, most of us, if only we would be on the level of children to, to have this level of fear, that to not sin because I'm afraid of getting punished. 
kid doesn't want to do something wrong, or if he does something wrong, he'll come and apologize so that he doesn't get the punishment. Okay, very good. As lo- whatever it takes, right, to not do the sin. But there's more than that. There's more spiritual maturity than that. And the next level is yirasachet, the fear of the sin itself. And that's at a point where, let's say, like, a kid brushing his teeth. So when a kid's real little, he's a toddler, he's afraid not to brush his teeth because he might get in trouble. He might not get dessert the next day if he doesn't brush his teeth. Or he might not get to play with his toys. So he'll brush his teeth because he's afraid of the punishment. When the kid gets a little bit older and he understands that there's something called dental hygiene, and he comprehends that it's actually good for him to brush his teeth, he becomes afraid not of the punishment that his parents might inflict externally as as an influence, but he'll be afraid of having cavities. He'll be afraid of having bad teeth. And so this is a level of spiritual maturity that we can reach where we understand that the sin itself is is harmful to us. It hurts us. It hurts our connection with God, which is really the same thing. So that's the second level. And the third level of fear, which, which is the ideal fear that we should have toward God, which is not a fear of, it's not a terror that God is, that I'm going to get hurt or that I'll be damaged or anything like that. It's the, it's awe when you, when you see the Grand Canyon and your breath gets taken away, you know, to have that experience thinking about God, the greatness of God, the omnipotence of God. But this level of fear isn't really any negativity associated with it. It's, it's a very powerful experience to, to be in the presence of omnipotence, where you feel infinitesimal, like you were saying before. So there is repentance from each one of these three levels. Very good, very healthy. The other level of tshuva, the fundamentally different level, is tshuva from ahava, tshuva from love. And this is when I so desperately want to be close to God that I regret everything I did because... Because I'm not with you. The core concept of love is unity, is joining into oneness. So when a person feels love toward God, they're just drawn towards oneness, by default they change. By default they're leaving everything they had behind when they reach that level of love. We're taught that the reason why these two different kinds of repentance, these two kinds of tshuva are are fundamentally different, is in one very specific outcome. The sin that the person is repenting for, if they did tshuva from fear, any one of those levels of fear, so then the sin gets wiped away. If they did the tshuva properly, if they repented properly, which I'll explain in a minute how to do that, then it just goes away. It's like it never happened. But if someone repents from love, from a place of love, of longing to become one with his creator, the sin itself becomes a mitzvah. It transforms into a merit. Now, that's fascinating. How does that happen? So someone that works out and lifts weights, what happens is when they lift the weight and they lift the weight to the point where their muscle fatigues and it's too extreme, the muscle actually tears, it rips. And when they eat well and get enough sleep and rest, the body recovers. The muscle doesn't just repair itself the way it was before. The muscle repairs itself even better and even stronger than before because it realized if this is the behavior of the person running this body so we were not well equipped it turns out that we need to be stronger than we were before so so this doesn't happen again so the body doesn't break it doesn't rip and so the muscle rebuilds itself even bigger and even stronger than it was before in order to be able to withstand the kind of pressure that it was under previously and to sort to use that analogy that's sort of what's happening with this sin and repentance from love. Because when the person does a sin, that's revealed in his character that he was someone that was willing to do that. He was on a level of spirituality where he was susceptible to such a thing, right? The muscle tore. His spirituality broke. He reached that point where he, where he, was a, where he failed and he was able to sin. If a person repents by being drawn close to God, not just because he's afraid of being punished. So what happens is, is that he becomes a stronger person. He becomes a stronger person to the point where he wouldn't do it again. In fact, the Rambam says that this is a condition in proper tshuva, that in order to really do true tshuva, true repentance, a person would have to be at a point where if they would theoretically be in the exact same scenario they were the last time, let's say a person sinned with a, with a woman, 
if he would be the exact same place, the exact same time with the exact same person, and he wouldn't do it, so then he has accomplished true true. Now, obviously, it's impossible to be in the exact same place and time and everything like that. But his point is that you have created within yourself a new person. And he says that as well. You become a completely different person, a person who wouldn't do that thing. Now you're bigger. You're stronger than you were before because you're no longer susceptible to what you were before. Now, the only reason it comes out that you are this strong now is because you failed the first time. If that temptation had never occurred, then you would have just gone along your life with that same weakness. It just hasn't come up. You were never put in a situation where you were tested in that way. But your, your essence, the definition of who you are is still very weak. The fact that a person has been broken, it's revealed that weakness. And once that weakness is revealed and he does the work to repair himself to become even stronger than he was before, now it comes out that that breaking was the impetus for the change. And now it's all part of the process. So the sin itself ends up becoming a process of the growth and is looked at as a merit in and of itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Now, you're not suggesting that if someone sinned with a, uh, a woman that they would necessarily have to go back and visit that woman to see whether or not they broke again. You're just saying that naturally what spiritually is occurring is because of that, that regret and the pain of knowing they did something so horrible that naturally strengthens them up. Yeah, the, you, you don't go back. Right? We say that uh, if you don't want to get hit by a train, you don't play on the tracks. In fact, that's the highest use of free will is to, to ensure that you'll never have to use it. It reminds me of when we decided we were going to first keep Shabbos. And it was so much stuff to remember how to do. It seemed so overwhelming. So I told my wife that the only way I'm going to follow the laws of Shabbos perfectly is just to get a, a gurney like they put Hannibal Lecter in where they strap me up to a gurney and just keep me strapped there. And at sundown, let me out, and I'll never sin. There's precedent for that. Sure. That's a Jewish idea. But you're saying there's, if, if you don't allow yourself to have those situations where that potential situation, you don't learn what to do, what not to do. You don't learn what's permitted, what's prohibited. All those things, you don't strengthen yourself and grow. You're not, you don't have the temptation to do something, then you don't strengthen yourself. Is that the, the general idea? Right. Yeah. And this is really a side point that we've come on to, which is that we don't enter into that temptation. In fact, I mean, you could take it to an extreme, right? A person might say that he will sin in order to do tshuva for it. Or on the other hand, maybe he'll just sin because he knows that he could do tshuva for it. So actually, that's, that's the opposite, right? We've, we've, meant, we've mentioned a case where the sin itself can become a mitzvah through tshuva. There's a situation where tshuva itself can be a sin. And that's if a person justifies doing the sin because they'll, they'll do tshuva later. It's the, same, it's the same idea. It's just on the flip side, right? Because it comes out that that person, if they didn't think that they had the option of repentance, they wouldn't have done it. Now, since the only justification for doing the sin was the fact that they'll do tshuva later, it comes out that the tshuva became part of the sin process. And so therefore, the tshuva doesn't work. And the person would have to do tshuva for that, which is even more difficult. Is that because when, after you do the sin and you do tshuva and you're forgiven, you're a new person. But if you've already decided in advance you're going to do it, then you're not the new person doing teshuva. You're the same person that agreed, that decided they were going to do the sin and do teshuva afterwards. Yeah, that's a different angle to look at it from that. But yeah, that's, yeah, great. Yeah, and for, and for that last point, you're right. We don't seek out those temptations, even for the sake of growth and teshuva. In fact, there are actually some opinions that say this is what Adam the first man did on purpose when he ate from that tree was he intentionally sinned in order to break himself so he could build himself up towards God again. It's a concept called an aver lishma, which means a, uh, a sin for the sake of God. But we don't do that. This is not, is not condoned. And that, that's a very controversial idea. But in general, we don't seek out temptation. The Talmud says that, let's say a man's walking, walking home, he has two paths to take. One path will take him directly home one path will take him by a river with women bathing. And the man says, what am I in this world for? I'm here to grow. I'm here to, to stand and withstand challenges. If I go straight home, what have I gained? Nothing. So I'll take the path with the women, and I won't look. And then I'll have accomplished something today. I can use my time wisely. The Talmud says if he takes the path with the women and he doesn't look, he's called a wicked person. Because choosing the path 
of putting yourself in a, in a trial, that in itself you've already failed by choosing trial. Because then there's only two options. Either you'll fail the trial or you'll succeed and fall into a different trap of confidence in yourself. Because when you turn right, you say, ah, I did it. I knew I could do it. Always avoid the temptation. Keep yourself safe. Don't worry. God's going to throw a lot of temptation at you anyway. So that's our approach. And then King David did that, did he not? He said, why, why am I not you know, at the level of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And God said, well, they had much greater tests. And he said, so test me. And then he failed it. Absolutely right. We're going to have our own test. God created our test for us. We don't need to go pursue other people's test. Right. And, and But more than that, that is the test. Right. When he asked, when he told David that I didn't test you, that was the test. The test was, what are you going to say next? Are you going to say, okay? Or was he going to ask for a new trial? That itself was the test. If he had just kept quiet, kept his mouth shut, that would have been it. He would have been Mashiach and the world would have been perfected. Okay. So the, the last thing that I want to wrap this up with is our frame of mind in approaching Yom Kippur with all of the restrictions. So very quickly, for people that aren't familiar, there are five main restrictions on Yom Kippur, in addition to all of the regular restrictions of work that apply in, on every Yom Tov, there are five additional restrictions on Yom Kippur, and they're referred to actually in the Torah as afflictions. You should afflict yourself. Now, this sounds pretty negative, right? This sounds like we're supposed to suffer. So we'll have to understand what this means, this affliction. But these five afflictions are as follows. Number one, no eating or drinking anything for the full 24 plus hours. Number two, no bathing. Number three, anointing oils. That's not really so common nowadays to anoint ourselves with oils, but that would sort of be the equivalent of putting on perfume or soaps or lotions or things like that. And number four, no marital relations, intimacy. That's forbidden. And number five, which is, I think, the weirdest on surface, is no wearing shoes. No leather shoes, right. So it, it's true that we derive that it's only leather, leather shoes that are included in the prohibition, but the concept is no wearing shoes. It's just that anything else that's not made of leather isn't considered halakhically a shoe. It's just some sort of wrapping on your foot, but it's not the concept of a shoe. Shoe is leather. That's an interesting idea to me also when I heard that. Why is that? But um, that, that's the standard, that a shoe is leather. So the idea of all of these five afflictions, now first of all, if you'll notice, all five of these things are passive. They're not active afflictions. We're not commanded to beat ourselves or sit out in the hot sun or cold, whatever it may be. All of these things are very passive. So that's already the first clue to what these things are really about. And uh, just to, to cut to the chase here, what these five afflictions are really about is, is we're not supposed to be suffering ourselves. We're supposed to be afflicting the body, pushing the body down. So now the question is, who are you? If you're your body, if you identify as your body, so you will suffer because that's the whole point. Afflict the body. If you identify with your physicality and that's it and you don't really, you're not in touch with your spiritual nature, so it will be pretty miserable because you're just going to be hungry. You're going to be uncomfortable and just sitting there bored. The basic idea here is we need to be shifting our perspective, shifting our focus from identifying as a body to identifying as a soul. It seems a bit intimidating at first because we think that you have to be a great saintly pious figure to be able to do that. But it's not true. Anyone, really anyone can do this if you try. You have to decide to make that attempt to decide to identify as your soul. You can, I promise you, you can bring yourself to that level and transcend beyond your body. Every single person can do it. But the idea of all of these five things, why you're afflicting the body, it's more than just hurting the body. What we're doing is we're passively refraining from things which connect the soul to the body. The first primary one is eating and drinking. Eating is the glue, so to speak, which connects the soul to the body, right? If you stop eating for long enough, eventually you start to feel faint. Uh, you start to lose consciousness. A person might pass out, and eventually a person will just die, meaning the soul just leaves the body permanently. Eating is what continues the soul's connection to the body, keeps us here in this world. So that's first and foremost, we don't eat. We refrain from that glue that connects the soul to the body. 
all of the other things are things which pamper and and care for the body, like bathing, putting oils on. Those two things are very much connected. That's sort of engaging in the physicality, which identifies, which we very much identify with the body when we do these kinds of things. Marital relations is a very intimate form of connection, of physicality. Now, ideally, that should also be transcendental, but it's, it's very much engaging the spirituality and the physicality together. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to stay on the level of pure spirituality and avoid the physicality. The very interesting one is not wearing shoes. Why is that? It is not for the purpose of hurting our feet. We're not supposed to suffer like that. Although some people say that that might get you into the spirit of atonement more to, to you know, have that anguish, but that's not a requirement at all, and that's not the most fundamental idea. The idea of wearing shoes, the concept of a shoe, is that the shoe is your interface with the world. It's how you move around. It's your avatar, right? You slip into your shoes and now you can walk around the whole world. It's harder for us to relate to now because there are so many clean surfaces that we can walk on. A person could theoretically walk around barefoot in most places on the street and the sidewalk and walk into establishments. And uh, it's not socially acceptable, but you theoretically could. In older times, it wasn't like that. You couldn't walk outside without shoes. Your feet would bleed or, or they would just get covered in mud and you couldn't walk in play. It was, it was, it just wasn't practical to walk around with that shoes, especially if you have to travel long distances. The shoes are what allow you to travel through the world. There's another mitzvah that's a little bit perplexing in the Torah called Yibum. And Yibum is the idea where if a man dies without children, he was married and he passed away from this world without any children, there's a mitzvah for, a, for the brother of that man to marry the wife just for the sake of having children. And we're taught that Kabbalistically, any children that the brother has with his former sister-in-law, those children will actually be spiritually attributed to the deceased brother. It's a very interesting concept, but it has to be done with pure intentions. And because it's so difficult to accomplish that with those pure intentions, the Torah gives an alternative. An alternative to Yibum, to that process, is called Chalitza. And Chalitza is a really weird practice where that woman goes to the brother, whoever would have been required to do Yibum, and she takes off his shoe and spits on the ground. It's like a weird thing. So to understand this as well, and this, how it connects to Yom Kippur as well, with the wearing shoes, what's a shoe? Is that Kabbalistically, the leg of a person is considered to be a child, or the opposite. A child is called Kara de Avua, the leg of the father. And the idea is that we, as a core being, we exist from the torso up, right? The core of me is, let's say, where my heart is, or if a person's more elevated, let's say maybe where their head is in their mind. But their legs is just sort of the vessel that carries them through the world and allows them to, con to um, travel around and, and interact with things. When a person passes from the world, they still have an aspect of themselves which continues in the world, and that's their children. The children is an extension of them. And that's why the, the mitzvahs, the commandments that a child performs can actually have an effect on the spirituality of their deceased parents even after their parents have passed away. Now, that, that seems a bit strange on the surface because once a person's gone, they don't have the opportunity to continue to grow, to continue to, to do mitzvahs for themselves. So, but their children can still affect them. And the reason for that is because the children, their children are the extension of them themselves. It's a spiritual extension, and it's the, the lower level of the body mapped out uh, in a spiritual way. And so what basically with this process of chalitza, when this woman takes off the brother's shoe, what she's showing him is that this is what you are doing to your brother. Your brother died without having children, without having any continuation of himself in the world, without being able to continue walking around in the world through via his children, you have an opportunity to give him that, and you're removing that from him. You're refraining from giving that opportunity to continue to walk around in the world. I'll take off your shoe to symbolize that that same idea, that now you have no ability to walk around in this world. And that's, that's the message she's trying to send by taking off the shoe. And this is, this is why we don't wear shoes on Yom Kippur. I've read that the soul is so lofty and so big that it's just like the lowest part of the soul 
is in the body and the body is like a shoe for the soul. What is the connection there between the body being like a shoe for the soul? I guess the same thing that our body as well allows our soul to traverse in, in this world. Exactly. Right. The body is the interface for the soul in order for the soul to have an ability to interact with the world and accomplish what it needs to accomplish. It needs an avatar. It needs an interface. And that's what the body is on a lower scale. Even within physicality, the body needs to be able to interact with the world to move around. And that's what the shoe does for the body. So the shoe does for the body what the body does for the soul. And so therefore, since we want to divorce the physicality and the spirituality on Yom Kippur and identify completely and totally with our spiritual form. So we further symbolize that by removing our shoes, removing our interface with the world. So just to, to clear this up, why are we doing this? Why are we separating physicality and spirituality and identifying only as a soul? How does it tie into the, the greater theme of things? And it's really the culmination of everything that we've spoken about up until now. The concept of mercy. What does mercy do? Mercy tells us that there's a better option for us, that we can return Instead of punishing us for everything we've done wrong or, or defining us very strictly as, as spiritually criminal, mercy allows us to return back to our source. And the best way to do that is to step back, right? Sometimes we need to retreat, go out camping and reassess who we are and uh, just get away from all of our normal everyday life. That's what Yom Kippur is to an extreme degree where we even leave the the interface of the body and the soul, which is the culmination of who we are. And we step back and we say, hold on, I'm really a soul. This is who I really am. There's a funny story that there is a local zoo and the zoo wasn't doing so well. It wasn't, they weren't selling a lot of tickets. And the manager of the zoo decided, well, if we had some lions, that would probably draw in a lot of people. Problem is, where are you going to get lions? So he put out an ad in the paper saying, we need some help in the zoo. Two guys answered the ad and he said, look, I want to tell you privately, we're having trouble here. We want you to put on these lion costumes. We've got really realistic lion costumes. You got to stay far away because if you get too close, people are going to realize it. Just go in the back. You don't have to do much. Just sit way back far away and just kind of hang out there and pretend to be lions. <laughs> okay, fine. Easy money. So they take the job and it's going pretty well. Sales are skyrocketing. People are coming to the zoo. They got lions now. It's real exciting. The zoo opens at 7 a.m. One day, or 6.45 a.m., these two guys... Right before work, they take off their mask, they're having a coffee. And people are standing behind the gate and they can see over there these guys in, in a lion suit and drinking coffee. And all of a sudden, everyone's in an uproar. And the manager, he's, he's losing everything. And he takes these two guys, he says, what are you doing? You took off your mask right in front of everyone, you're, you're drinking a coffee. And the two guys say, oh, what's the problem? All day we're lions for 15 minutes, we can't be people. Right? It's ridiculous because those 15 minutes is enough to show who you really are. People have the same problem when they get to Yom Kippur. They say, oh, it's like a joke, right? The opposite. All year long, I'm, uh, I'm doing X, I'm doing Y, I'm doing Z. And on Yom Kippur, I'm supposed to pretend like I'm this holy person. But the truth is that when you step back and you, you exit your body, you realize that you're a soul. Those 15 minutes, that one day of Yom Kippur, that shows you who you really are. That's the real you. That's what defines you. You connect to that. That's your ticket. That was wonderful. I appreciate you sharing that that information with us, and I'll take that with me, this, this Yom Kippur. I will tell my body beforehand that 364 days out of the year, it's all about you, bud. But you get a day off, and I'm focusing on me. That's right. You got to dive in 100%, and you'll love it. You will. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking Donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.